Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing the important topic of suicide prevention, particularly pertaining to our high school and college students. And we'll share some important resources that could save lives. Our special guests today are Kelly Davis, Vice President of Youth and Peer Advocacy of Mental Health America in Virginia, Rene Pinheiro, Vice President of Behavioral Health and Clinical Operations of Mental Health Association of Massachusetts, and John Orr, the Vice President of Programs for Vibrant Emotional Health in New York. Thank you so much for, for joining. It, I'm going to go uh, quickly to you, Kelly, uh, but just to, sort of to set, set you up. Suicidal thoughts are really common among teens and young adults, particularly among teens and young adults who are grappling with all sorts of different issues, right? Coming into adulthood identity, dealing with with this real change, the whole anxiety of being an adult. 11% of young adults report serious thoughts of suicide and between one and 2% report an attempt. So these uh, numbers are actually higher. just if we focus on on high school students with nearly 20% reporting serious suicidal uh, thoughts. So this is a real issue. I mean, if we're if we're talking about 20%, what that means is that when we walk into any high school and we walk through those corridors, we are passing people who have very, very serious suicidal thoughts. Isn't that isn't that the case, Kelly? Yeah, it is pretty astounding for a topic that we often don't talk about. During 2020, right, there'd been a decade of increases in depression, suicide attempts, suicidal thoughts among young people, and the pandemic obviously really escalated that. There was a um, survey that came out of the CDC that one in four young adults seriously considered suicide in 2020, so it's a really big problem, but it's often... It can be it can be hard to really talk about. I think people are afraid if they bring it up, they might put the idea in someone's head, which we know isn't true. And I think that there's a lot of shame or guilt, whether you lost someone to suicide, whether you've um, had a suicide attempt or thought about it because of societal stigma and beliefs around what it means to struggle. That's why, you know, I am a multiple suicide attempt survivor um, during my adolescence. And I think it's really important for us to have these conversations and for people to disclose their shared experience because so many people are dealing with this profound issue and challenge in silence. Well, let's talk about that issue of shame, uh, Renee. If I have suicidal thoughts, if I've had suicidal thoughts, should I be ashamed of how my mind is bringing me into that place? Should I feel shame? And how do I deal with that first barrier to just sharing with with someone else, Renee? Yeah, absolutely not. You should never feel shame because of those thoughts and emotions that you're dealing at that moment. I think one of the most important things is to surround yourself with family, friends, and a community that is supportive and that is able to bring you to that environment when you can open up and talk about these things. Like Kelly mentioned, there's still a lot of stigma in regards to mental health, substance use disorders, and especially suicide. And it's very concerning because like you mentioned, uh, with statistics, a lot of cases are not reported. So you can definitely uh, feel like there are way more cases than that, especially when we're talking about suicidal ideation, which not a lot of people talk about. So let's talk about the origins of this, John. There are a lot of different ways in which people can get to that place. Uh, And uh, Renee uh, mentioned the the whole issue of substance use disorder, and uh, Kelly talked about a sense of isolation. Uh, Could you just sort of try to, uh, for us all, give us a sense of how the different routes that people get to that that very um, isolated, dark, and, uh, and hopeless place? Sure. Uh, well, one of the things I think is really uh, important to note about that is that a lot of times the responsibility is placed upon the individual that they have ended up in this place of isolation, uh, you know, for due to some faults of their own, and it doesn't give credit to any of the societal issues that are coming up, you know. And some of those can be, you know, some of the disparities within the healthcare system, you know racism, discrimination, there are a lot of factors, you know, that can contribute externally to an individual, you know, feeling isolated. You know, that will lead us into then, you know, considering what are someone's like individual risk factors. And, you know, I think about high school, I think about bullying, you know, I think about 
the effects of you know peer influence. And you know some of the things that have come up for young people that we know now are there are just coordinated attacks. You know, bullying seems almost too light a word with the way that young people might share sexual images of another young person. And so that, you know, there are a lot of social factors, you know, that contribute to it as well. And then, you know, I think we can get into the fact that, you know, there may be, you know, some genetic factors that have contributed contributed to someone's exp- experience of depression. Um, or if you're familiar with the adolescent childhood um, adversity scale, the ACEs study, you know, those factors contribute, you know, to isolation and depression as well. What is going on when somebody gets to that point? What is what does suicide mean to somebody who is contemplating suicide? Um, could you know anyone should just jump in? What 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 does that mean? I mean, I can share because I want to build a little bit on what John just said about the social environment and context. I hear a lot of people. Um, be dismissive of young people that, oh, this generation doesn't have resilience. That's why they have all these problems. But the world's really, really different now, even outside of COVID. I mean, the ways in which teenagers are expected to be basically professionals, right? There's there's a lot of times you can't do things for fun. It's way harder to get into college. There's all these pressures, you know, high school athletes are like professional athletes. Now it's just, it's just a whole other level of pressure. You're thinking about like climate change, the political climate that they're growing up in. And I think, and you know, for, for other young people, exposure to community violence, gun violence that we're seeing in a lot of cities. But I think, um, what the overwhelming theme I hear from other suicide attempt survivors is really a sense of despair or hopelessness, like things will not get better or the amount of pain that I'm experiencing has outweighed like so much more than what I feel like I'm able to handle that this feels like my only way out. And I think when you add on all the pressures of adolescence with the social and societal changes we're seeing, um, I think it makes a little more sense because you can't really escape social media. We couldn't escape the pandemic. There's all the societal pressure. So I think it's really isolation and lack of hope for the future. So I have a question for you all. Um, to what extent, I know they're interrelated. To what extent is this, is this uh, 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 the fact that we all live in a chemical soup in our brains, right? We are all affected by what's going on and trauma, of course, affects you know, that chemical soup, and it could bring us to a dark place. To what extent is this uh, chemically induced? And to what extent is this environmentally sort of the, this feeling of, of despair, no way out, and so on? And I, the, the story that I have to tell you all is that um, I was prescribed a couple of medications for, you know, various things, and those medications interacted really poorly. And I went into a really dark place. And, you know, I was like, whoa, I've got to deal with this, went back to my doctor and eliminated, um, I actually ended up eliminating both medications. And, you know, it was like switching a light switch. Now that was a chemically induced condition, but there are, you know, those, those kinds of things are, uh, John, you had mentioned, you know, some of this might be biological, um, some of it, and if, if there is, if it is biological, and if it is also something where, the stresses are affecting our body chemistry, um, then there may be some ways in which we can shift, right? We might actually have the ability to control what's going on if we have the techniques to do that. Control is a pretty interesting word, uh, you know, I think, in the world of, of mental health. And I think everybody hopes to, to find that in, in some way. Uh, but I think... I guess in my own experiences and working with people and my own struggles as a human being, I feel like balance is more the word, you know, that that I aim for in finding resources to allow someone to feel balanced and a sense of wholeness. You know, because oftentimes, um, you know, when we experience something distressing, um, it can create a level of distress within us where we're fighting against ourselves and, and we take on this identity as someone with a problem and, and that internal struggle, um, you know, it raises the stress level and, you know, it increases 
things like cortisol, you know, the stress hormone and the way that can affect someone. And some of the things that, you know, when it comes down to like, you know, the idea of chemical imbalances, I think some of the recent research has really challenged some of the ideas around um, this idea that there, that, uh, that, that there is a chemical imbalance, that they haven't been able to support that. You know, although that's kind of common, you know, within our, in our, in our language and society that, oh yeah, I, I'm dealing with a chemical imbalance. It, it's more complicated than that. Um, not to say that there aren't chemicals and that when we add substances into our body, that those don't interact with things that are already present, but you know, it, it's a, it's a, a bigger issue. It doesn't have a, a convenient um, explanation, I think. So sometimes you have to let go. Sometimes you just have to create some sort of an equilibrium within yourself. Uh, Renee, are you are you seeing it the same way? Is there as as you approach uh, young people, how do you counsel them? Because everybody's coming from a different place, right? Everybody has a different set of issues. There can't just be one prescription. How do you how do you go about actually helping people who you don't know? and who might be coming in to this issue from all these different possible directions. Absolutely. Like you mentioned, uh, it's not only about letting go, but working with the issues. And then again, you need to know the person. You need to get to know them, do a proper assessment to find out what are the different things that might be affecting them and establish that rapport and that relationship where somebody can get to trust you in regards to dealing with these things. But definitely it's something like you mentioned, you use the word techniques and also uh, that's something that's basically therapy for us. Uh, when you're doing therapy, you need to change that mindset. You need to work those things within yourself so that you're able to see the world and see yourself in a more positive and different way so that you're able to face all of the different things that we mentioned that are happening in the world and probably a lot of trauma and history of difficult things that the person has dealt with. And therapy isn't just one thing, right? I mean, it's not just talking. It could be exercise. It could be diet. It could be just being with friends. It could be relaxing. Uh, Kelly, could you just uh, keep going on with the list? What do you What do you understand in terms of the kinds of treatments that can be available, and what are what, what What's the role of, of family and friends in all this? Yeah, I mean, even when you talk about therapy, there's a lot of different modalities of therapy as well. I think that's actually what I was going to say as somebody who works primarily in the world of peer support and not clinical services is the ability to have someone sit there and listen to you and validate what you're experiencing is so important and healing when it comes to a topic that people feel like they can't say out loud at all. I think as family members or people who love someone and care about someone who's talking about suicide or any struggle, right? The instinct is to want to fix it. And that's a really good way to cause someone who shared you, shared that with you to shut down. So I think for us to say, you're not here to fix anyone, but you, you're you here to listen and create a safe space and then work with them to see what they might want. That could be just sitting with someone in silence, like helping them get groceries, like all of these like really basic human connection things. Whereas a family member or a friend, it's not your responsibility to save someone or do anything like that. It's, it's really about human connection and making someone feel valued and supporting them in just knowing someone's there and there's someone who they can talk to who won't judge them. Is, is suicide my fault? If somebody in my life commits suicide, how do I think about that? No, absolutely not uh, your fault or anybody's fault. You know, I, you know having, I lost my best friend um, you know, to suicide and maybe 15 years ago. Those were thoughts that I wrestled with personally. You know, and what are, what are the contributing factors that, that I added, you know, just to, as, uh, we'd missed the warning signs. Like we, we didn't, we didn't, we weren't informed. And, you know, looking back on it, there were plenty of warning signs, but we didn't know it. I, and I can say that, you know, over time, it, as, as I've thought about it, the thing that is for certain for me is that my friend uh, was suffering from an illness and it was an illness, you know, that took him. You know, and, and I, I don't think he's to blame and I don't think others are to blame. You know, I think that, 
It's the reality of an illness. Not to say that people can't be contributing factors to the distress of others, but you know, when it comes down to who are the people um, who are still here after someone is gone, I, I don't think that they deserve one. Renee, how do you see that question? Definitely, I see the same way. It's not your fault, uh, but definitely I feel like we always ask ourselves, what would, could we have done? Could we have done more? And unfortunately, like John mentioned, uh, these are learning experiences. Uh, when this happens to you, you learn to be uh, more open to other people, to be aware of different signs that might be uh, they might be perceiving or uh, sending our way so that we're able to then uh, prevent these things from happening with other people. Yeah, if I can just add on to that, I think there's the processing, is there something I could have done differently? But I think part of that extends to how people feel like other people, what they'll think about them if they share that a family member or someone close to them attempted or died by suicide. I was at fundraiser last night and a woman said it took six months for her to even say to one other person that her daughter died by suicide because she really blamed herself. And she did it. She, she felt that other people would blame her as well because a lot of these um, misguided beliefs or even assumptions about how other people will feel and respond. And sometimes they do respond that way. And I think it's, it's valid for people to be concerned and part of why we need real social change around these conversations. Yeah, I'm not, uh, for, for myself, I'm not sure that I've ever found an answer um, uh, to, that, to that question. I think that, that um, uh, you, you, you sort of carry a, a view that, um, that there was perhaps more that could have been done had one been aware, you know, more aware, had I been more aware um, and uh, people around me had been more aware. But um, I, I don't know that there's a th th there's an easy answer that works for everyone. You're you're just trying to grapple. And and uh, John, I think your your point um, about uh, sort of learning, right? Learning and and um, and then uh, taking someone's life and placing it into your heart and your experience and being informed by their lives is 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 the best one can do. But it's an imperfect process. In terms of 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 treating people and interacting with, with, with others. Um, you know, we, we were talking a little bit before the show started about the fact that it used to be that everything had to happen in person. And then we had telephones that we could talk and we could, we could write letters, um, you know, and then, and, and then later on, um, you know, we, we're now at the point where we can look face to face. We have all of our little devices and so on. Um, have, have that, has that, um, influenced how you the tool sets that you use um, in in helping people navigate I definitely think that had that has been one of the benefits from COVID-19 that it has opened up remote services for us here in um, Western Mass we're doing a lot of therapy be it via phone via video I know there's also a lot of apps that are addressing mental health issues uh, so there's a lot of technology and new ways to find help John Kelly, um, are, is technology a good or a bad thing? You know, we we hear about some of the ways that technology can also harm um, people's mental health. Uh, you, would you like to comment? Well, I, I, yeah, I think it's tough to say it's either good or bad uh, when it comes down to technology. But I, similar to Renee, one of the things that we've been able to do is reach more people, uh, you know, via telehealth uh, here in New York City. Um, Interestingly, though, you know, some of the, the barriers that we've run into in working with young people uh, and, and their families you know, providing clinical services via telehealth is that um, we have to make sure that they understand we're not entertainers, you know, that we're not one more box on the screen you know, and that this should be treated with some special regard. And you know, we've had to provide families with education about that and and stress the importance that we're, we're not just something that you can kind of act as a babysitter and put over here, or, you know, turn us off really quickly. So those are some of the things that we've, you know, kind of, we're try always trying to find our best practices, you know, for what telehealth means and, and 
I think that's the ongoing question for us. We just completed two um, two polls. One, we found that half the people know somebody or have been personally affected by uh, suicide and, su- and suicidal ideation. The other is we asked about whether uh, there are sufficient resources. And it was interesting that uh, 100% of the people who responded thought that there are insufficient resources uh, to help young people in particular uh, navigate. Is, is it a matter of insufficient money being spent or is it, is it a matter of insufficient awareness in society uh, that allows for early intervention, Kelly. What do you What do you think? Is this a dollars and cents issue? Is it an awareness issue, or is it or is it somewhat of a both? First, I wanted to go back to just the previous conversation because I think that there's a really important distinction in adults and young people where online is just part of their world. It's not necessarily a big distinction, right? Having grown up you know, with an iPad, it's just very different. I think for us, um, one of the big things that we've seen, so we, uh, and the Mental Health America's national office do not do direct service, but we provide, one of our largest programs is an online mental health screening program. Over 16 million people have come and taken these depression, anxiety, looking for resources. Um, oh, about two thirds are under 24. So it's a lot of young people who are really not doing well And their biggest interests were things that they can do on their own, learning more information and getting connected to peers versus just immediately going to clinical services. So I think it's really important to note that the way that young people navigate the world now is just different. Um, I think one of the other important pieces that came up. So it's a focus on community is what you're saying. It's really about peers and community more than going to a medical professional or somebody who is older or somebody who is uh, has a particular expertise. It's like, no, wait a second. You know who has the expertise? People like me. I think it's definitely both. And I think that's part of when we're prioritizing where to invest, right? So there's a massive mental health provider shortage, especially for young people, especially if you're talking about psychiatrists, Um, But then there's also been a really historic lack of investment in young people themselves and how they can support one another. One of the evidence-based approaches to reducing suicide in schools is training young people directly about mental health education and suicide prevention. There's a lot more effort, especially with a lot of the funding that's gone to states in the past couple of years to really build out those programs. So, yes, there's not enough. But I think it's about thinking about more comprehensively. Um, one of the examples I use, right, is like if you and, and part of this is my lived experience, right? After a suicide attempt, you could go to the hospital, you can get connected to the providers, they can be as good as they can be, and then you can go back to school and people make fun of you for trying to kill yourself, right? So it's like, how do you or you exist in your community every other hour outside of the hour you're in those offices that week? So I think working with young people and empowering young people, you just have to do that to change culture. And, and young people are really interested in learning about this stuff too. Are there hot points in society where if we were going to create a heat map of people living in particular circumstances, rural versus urban versus suburban, uh, people of certain ages we've already identified that people in high school and and uh, going into college are, you know, that, that age group is, is very vulnerable. We have poverty, we have um, identity, issues of orientation, issues of race, issues, my goodness. Uh, are there, is there a heat map that we can look at, Renee, to give us a sense of where resources in this country ought to be focused because people living in that particular set of circumstances are particularly vulnerable so that we can do a little bit more preventive, be a little bit more preventive in terms of how we think about investing in in these resources. I mean, there's definitely heat maps, and especially, like you mentioned, there are so many things that are going on. We have an opioid epidemic, we have racial issues. We have so many things that we need to see how we're gonna invest in those uh, services. But then again, I think that a lot of times uh, the service providers are undervalued and they're not compensated properly. And I think that's one of the main issues because 
like uh, Kelly mentioned, there's a big difference in providing services to adults and to youth. Uh, providing services to the youth is way more involved. You need to collaborate with schools, with teachers, Department of uh, Children and Families, with the parents themselves. And it takes more to uh, develop those relationships and provide that treatment. And I feel like a lot of times they're not equally compensated when it comes to that because it's way harder to provide it. And unfortunately, I've seen it here historically how more and more service providers stop providing services for children because of the difficulty and they just continue seeing adults. So I feel that should be very concerning. Um, I'd like to, to end up, and, and I'd like everybody to comment on this um, with a, a, a question to you all. Over half of suicides occur through firearms. Um, I don't wanna get into a discussion of second amendment rights and so on. I think that those are, those are discussions that there are valid points to be made on all sides. But the means of, of, of quickly um, going from thought to execution is, is really stunning. And if you take a look at how many people uh, die through firearm suicide every year, um, how, do, how do we deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I can speak quickly to that. I think there's this misguided belief that people have that if somebody wants to kill themselves, they'll just find any way to do it. But there's a lot of evidence to support that eliminating access to lethal means really does reduce suicide. So for young people, right, obviously, you know, people under 21, people who are under 18, if you own a firearm, making sure that that young person does not have access to it or cannot access it is really important. And then we as an organization, you know, uh, this is a very contentious issue in the U.S., but have worked with um, like there's a lot of work in rural parts of the country in working with the folks who actually sell guns to help identify signs of risk or prepare people who are purchasing firearms about the potential risks and issues of suicide in their community. So I think that there's um, the means reduction is really, really, really important if you're worried about someone. And then there's ways to same with social media. This is what it is right now. Like, this is where we are with guns in this country. How do we reduce harm when it comes to people dying by suicide? Renee, John, do you have any? John? I, yeah, Kelly's point was excellent. I, just gun locks, gun safes, you know, things that uh, prevent access, I, I think is really the key there. Definitely better regulations. Uh, I mean, if we're not going to decrease the number of firearms that we have in this country, then definitely preventing access to people who might be vulnerable and might end up hurting themselves is something that we need to focus on. Yeah, I think I think that and and just sort of being aware, uh, being aware that there are people you can call. There's the 988 hotline. So I want everybody to just be aware that that, that exists, um, that that there is help out there. Um, and um, can you all just uh, share with us uh, how people can get in touch with your organizations, uh, John, Renee, and then uh, we'll end up with Kelly? Well, my organization, fortunately, we're the administrators of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And, and so, you know, if, if someone's in great need, I, I would suggest use, utilizing 988 um, for suicide prevention and also mental health crisis in general. Don't wait, in other words. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, and our, our organization's website is vibrant.org. And one other thing that we found really helpful with high school students is our information on Be The One Too uh, and Be The One To Help, which has a five-step protocol on how to talk to someone if they're, they seem like they might be suicide. So I recommend checking that out. Thanks so much, John. Renee? A particular organization, MHA, can be accessed through mhainc.org or 1-844-MHA-HELP. Uh, but I know that the state also has a lot of directories for either support groups, uh, treatments, so it's they can easily be accessed. Uh, we just need to provide the resources for more treatment providers to be available. And Kelly? Yeah, so I would say it's a bit twofold. We have affiliates across the country. Um, but we do a lot of policy work. So if you're interested in getting involved in some of the laws and regulations and funding that we mentioned, um, mhanational.org, we have a lot of information. You can get involved from the policy advocacy side. But then if you're looking for help for yourself or a loved one or 
just to share how people can learn more about mental health, they can go to mhascreening.org for the um, clinically validated mental health screens and a lot of information about a lot of concerns that especially young people are facing. And there's no shame because when you're in a crowd, when you're walking along the way, when you are sitting in a ballpark watching a game or, or going to a concert, if you just reach out within your arm's length, there is somebody here who has experience uh, with suicide, suicidal ideation. We're all part of this, this family. We all have these, these, uh, these uh, struggles to contend with. So let's share and let's, go, let's reach out for help. Kelly Davis, Vice President of Youth and Peer Advocacy of Mental Health America. Renee Pinheiro, Vice President of Behavioral Health and Clinical Operations of the Mental Health Association of Massachusetts and John Orr, Vice President of Programs of Vibrant Emotional Health in New York. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us. Please thank your staffs. Please thank your volunteers. And there are a lot of them. Please thank your funders. Uh, we really appreciate your help in understanding and navigating this very complex situation.